philosophy, science, and theology slash spiritualities slash religions are indeed uh, separate compartmentalized academic studies in their own right, but what happens if we attempt to open up lines of communication between the sciences, the various philosophies that have been put forward since antiquity, and the world's spiritualities and mysticisms and religions. What happens when they start having a healthy conversation, these four main academics, religion, spirituality, sciences, philosophy, etc. So I'm going to start this post with some terms I'm going to read you some information concerning the dialogue that these three categories are indeed having. Although many want to have uh, orthodox, cut and dry answers, no one field of academics, although they may disagree, scientists, theologians, philosophers, is an island. And I believe that the idea of a universal philosophy and a unified theory of the three academics is feasible. So the first thing I'll be touching on is a definition, and I like Wikipedia because it's short and sweet and concise. Most of their definitions make sense, so I'm going to be referring a lot to those. And I have an article to read as well. So as an introduction type of post to the next back cover book report, and you'll see how it all fits together when I'm finished with this particular project. So the first Wikipedia term I want to cover and read, alternatives, and not many uh, evolutionary scientists agree on everything, and there are definitely alternative models to Darwin's uh, evolution which is basically what they have been teaching our students in our public schools for quite some time now, Darwinian evolution. But there are other models that have emerged over the history of the conversation between religions, science, theology. So we have alternatives to the Darwinian evolution and this is what Wikipedia says. Alternatives to Darwinian evolution. And how might philosophy and theology have a piece in this conversation? We're going to get to that. Alternatives to Darwinian evolution have been proposed by scholars investigating biology to explain signs of evolution and the relatedness of different groups of living things. The alternatives in question do not deny that evolutionary changes over time are the origin of the diversity of life, nor that the organisms alive today share a common ancestor from the distant past, 
or ancestors in some proposals. Rather, they propose alternative mechanisms of evolutionary change over time. Arguing against mutations acted by on by natural selection as the most important driver of evolutionary change. Arguing against mutations acted on by natural selection or random processes. In other words, the model of evolution that leaves God out of the equation is the one that is mainly Darwinian in nature. This distinguishes them from certain other kinds of arguments that deny that large-scale evolution of any sort has taken place. As in some forms of creationism slash uh, creation science, for example, that adheres to a young earth theory and it's these forms which do not propose alternative mechanisms of evolutionary change, but instead deny that evolutionary change has taken place at all. They deny it in, uh, with their choice to adhere to a type of interventionist supernaturalism associated with classical theism. Not all forms of creationism deny that evolutionary change takes place, notably proponents of theistic evolution, which we'll be uh, hitting on as well. Such as the biologist Asa Gray assert that evolutionary change does occur and is responsible for the history of life on Earth, with the provisio that this process has been influenced by a god or gods in some meaningful sense, so that you have the alternative of theistic evolution, which includes God in its equation of life. where the fact of evolutionary change was accepted, but the mechanism proposed by Charles Darwin, that of natural selection, was denied. Explanations of evolution such as Lamar Lamarckism, catastrophism, orthogenesis, vitalism, structuralism, and mutationism called saltationism before 1900 were entertained. So there have been a lot of evolutionary theories over time. But Darwin's simplistic biological evolutionary view of random selection and chance has taken the majority within academics and thought to be the only model available. But this is not true. There are things that we are not being told in church or the classroom, <clears throat> which is one reason why I've decided to create this post and the following post concerning my next back cover book report. And it covers these ideas as well. Different factors motivated people to propose non-Darwinian mechanisms of evolution and certainly have natural selection with its emphasis on death and competition did not appeal to some naturalists because they felt it immoral. Okay, so where did they get their sense of morality? Just asking the question. Leaving little room for teleology or the concept of progress 
orthogenesis in the development of life. Some who came to accept evolution, but disliked natural selection, raised religious objections. Others felt that evolution was an inherently progressive process that natural selection alone was insufficient to explain. Still, others felt that nature, including the development of life, followed orderly patterns that natural selection could not explain. By the start of the 20th century, evolution was generally accepted by a biologist, but natural selection was in eclipse. Many alternative theories were proposed, and I would add, and are being proposed. Theories, and that is all they are, never accept a theory as fact unless it is agreed upon across the board. And the debate continues, nevertheless. Many alternative theories were proposed, but biologists were quick to discount theories such as orthogenesis, vitalism, and lamarckism, which offered no mechanism for evolution. Mutationism did propose a mechanism, but it was not generally accepted. The modern synthesis, a generation later claimed to sweep away all the alternatives to Darwinian evolution, because based on, on their particular worldview, it's competition and survival of the quote-unquote fittest might, makes, right, etc. Though some have been revived as molecular mechanisms for them have been discovered. That said, they used the word mechanism, and that reminded me of a previous back cover book report. And if you have not yet picked up the text, I would recommend it as well. Entitled, The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism. And that is a very enlightening read if you would uh, have the chance to pick that up, I would recommend it. Thomas Brophy, I believe, is the author. So there we have the alternatives to, to, in the history of different theories of evolution, and I'm sure there are indeed more that I'm unaware of, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. So we move to our next term, our next Wikipedia term, creation science. And to mainstream scientists, this particular branch of quote-unquote science is considered false or a pseudoscience based on reactionary politics. So Wikipedia has this term. Creation science or scientific creationism is a pseudoscientific form of young earth creationism which claims to offer scientific arguments for certain literalist and inerrant ists interpretations of the Bible. It is often presented without overt faith-based language but instead relies on reinterpreting scientific results to argue that various myths in the book of Genesis and other select biblical passages are scientifically valid. And I would say that they are scientifically valid, but not in an anti-evolutionary stance. The most commonly advanced ideas of creation science, so-called, include special creation based on the Genesis creation narrative and flood geology based on the Genesis flood narrative. Creationists also claim they can disprove and re-explain a variety of scientific facts, including all evolutionary theories. 
theories and paradigms of geology, cosmology, biological evolution, archaeology, history, and linguistics using creation science. Creation science was foundational to the intelligent design theory. The overwhelming consensus of the scientific community is that creation science fails to qualify as scientific because it lacks empirical support, supplies no testable hypothesis, and resolves to describe natural history in terms of scientifically untestable supernatural causes. Courts, most often in the United States, where the question has been asked in the context of teaching the subject in public schools, have consistently ruled since the 1980s that creation science is a religious view rather than a scientific one. And so that idea was rejected by education, by educators. Historians, philosophers of science, and skeptics have described creation science as a pseudo-scientific attempt to map the Bible into scientific facts. Professional biologists have criticized creation science for being unscholarly and even as dishonest and misguided sham with extremely harmful educational consequences. The religious basis. Creation science is based largely upon chapters 1 through 11 of the book of Genesis. These describe how God calls the world into existence through the power of speech. And God said, let there be light, etc. In six days, calls all the mammal, animals and plants into existence and molds the first man from clay and the first woman from a rib taken from the man's side. A worldwide flood destroys all life except for Noah and his family and representatives of the animals. And Noah becomes the ancestor of the 70 nations of the world. The nations live together until the incident of the Tower of Babel, when God disperses them and gives them their different languages. Creation science attempts to explain history and science within the span of a literalist biblical chronology, a linear approach to time, which places the initial act of creation some 6,000 years ago. And many dispensationalist fundamentalist denominations also have adopted this approach. A biblical literalist interpretation, a dispensational view, if you will. Modern religious affiliations. Most creation science proponents hold fundamentalist or evangelical Christian beliefs in biblical literalism and biblical inerrancy as opposed to the higher criticism supported by liberal Christianity, progressive, <clears throat> in the fundamentalist modernist controversy. However, there are also examples of Islam and Jewish scientific creationism that conform to the accounts of creation as recorded in their religious doctrines. The SDA Church, or Seventh-day Adventist, has a history of support for creation science. The Museum of the Bible also supports this partial view, I would say. This dates back to George McKetty Price, an active SDA uh, who developed views of flood geology, which formed the basis of creation science. The work was continued by the Geoscience Research Institute, an official institute of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, located on its Loma Linda University campus in California. Creation science is general, generally rejected by the Church of England as well as the Roman Catholic Church. The Pontifical Gregorian University has officially discussed intelligent design as a cultural phenomenon without scientific elements. The Church of England's official website 
cites Charles Darwin's local work, assisting people in his religious parish. And all of this uh, within the creation science models also affects their views on science and history as well. And also interpretations of the biblical text is also seen through this particular lens. Uh, and there's a lot of metaphysical assumptions. Metaphysical assumptions, quote, creation science makes the a priori metaphysical assumption that there exists a creator of the life whose origin is being examined. Christian creation science holds that the description of creation is given in the Bible and that the Bible is inerrant in this description and elsewhere that is without contradiction or mistake, whether literary or translation mistakes, those are often glossed over. That the Bible is inerrant in this description and therefore empirical scientific evidence must correspond with that description. Creationists also view the preclusion of all supernatural explanations within the sciences as a doctrinaire commitment to exclude the supreme being in miracles. They claim this to be the motivating factor in science's acceptance of Darwinism, a term used in creation science to refer to evolutionary biology, which is also often used as a disparagement. Critics argue that creation science is religious rather than scientific because it stems from faith in a religious text rather than by the application of the scientific method. Perhaps even to the point of idolizing the text. The United States National Academy of Sciences has stated unequivocally, quote, evolution pervades all biological phenomena. To ignore that it occurred or to classify it as a form of dogma is to deprive the student of the most fundamental organizational concept in the biological sciences. No other biological concept has been more extensively tested and more thoroughly corroborated than the evolutionary history of organisms. Anthropologist Eugene Scott has noted further, religious opposition to evolution propels anti-evolutionism, which is what cre uh, uh, creation science is a form of. Although anti-evolutionists pay lip service to supposed scientific problems with evolution, and there are indeed a few, what motivates them to battle its teaching is apprehension over the implications of evolution for religion or for their particular brand of exclusivist Christian classical theism. Creation science advocates, advocates argue that scientific theories of the origins of the universe, earth, and life are rooted in a priori presuppositions of methodological naturalism and uniformitarianism, each of which they reject in some areas of science, such as chemistry, meteorology, or medicine, creation science proponents do not necessarily challenge the application of naturalistic or uniformitarian assumptions, but instead single out those scientific theories they judge to be in conflict with their religious beliefs. And it is against those theories that they concentrate their efforts. Next term I'd like to cover, and I've covered this in the past, but I'll review it, is the term 
called dipolar theism, which is paramount in uh, to know because you'll have to know this term in order to understand proceeding posts on this subject, namely the upcoming back cover book report, which is based on this paradigm. Dipolar theism in process theology, dipolar theism is a position that to conceive a perfect God one must conceive him as embodying the quote-unquote good and sometimes opposing characteristics. Therefore, such a deity cannot be understood to embody only one set of characteristics, hence the term dipolar instead of monopolar. Overview, for instance, here are some characteristics commonly associated with God. One, many, transcendent, imminent, eternal, temporal, mutable, immutable, merciful, just, simple, and complex. It's not one or the other, it's both. It's not either or. Dipolar theism holds that in each pair, both of the characteristics contain some element of good. So the eminent pole and the transcendent pole are interconnected, interrelated, and always affecting one another. That is the physical pole, of which theologian Charles Hartshorn observed that the universe could indeed be the physical aspect of God's body, universally speaking. Okay. God must embody the good in both characteristics and cannot be limited to one pole. So there's that aspect of dipolar theism opposed to or comparable to classical theism, which its focus is seemingly only on one aspect, that is the transcendent supernatural quote-unquote aspect of the Godhead, completely separate and wholly other from matter or earth or universe. For instance, there is a good in being just and also a good in being merciful. In being just, God determines that the good are rewarded and the evil are punished. In being merciful, God gives those who sin. It follows, therefore, that a God that was only just and only merciful would be less than perfect. Dipolar theism holds that a perfect God must embody the good in both of those characteristics, Thus, a perfect God has the good characteristics of justice and the good characteristics of mercy. Alternatively, there is good in having absolute power and good in leading by persuasion. For a God to be perfect, he cannot rule solely by predestination because then he would lack the good possessed by a God who led by persuasion. God must therefore embody the good in both power and persuasion. From this conclusion, some reject the existence of an omnipotent God. So, that reminds me of Charles Hartshorn's nifty little gem of a book entitled Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes, and that is a uh, dissertation on Charles Hartshorn's variant uh, and process perspective. And so Charles Hartshorn is the one that coined 
the term dipolar theism by the way. And so what happens when science philosophers and theologians open a productive conversation? We have terms emerge such as this. And the next Wikipedia term I want to cover is theistic evolution. And this is what Wikipedia says concerning this. Theistic evolution, also known as theistic evolutionism, or God-guided evolution, alternatively called evolutionary creationism, which most uh, young earth creationists, classical theists, Christian exclusivists, fundamentalist evangelicals reject as they have been conditioned by the system, I would say, to reject it. They are wholly anti-evolution. But there is middle ground and there is hope for a healthy conversation between science and theology. At least, that is my hope. <clears throat> so also called evolutionary creationism is a view that God acts and creates through laws of nature rather than or as an alternative to uh, supernaturalist interventionist escapist type theology here and this is definitely what you would call a natural theology here, God is taken as the primary cause, while natural causes are secondary, positing that the concept of God and religious beliefs are compatible with the findings of modern science, including evolution. So, rather than outright rejecting all scientific theories within the mainstream sciences, which is what uh, creation scientists tend to do. Theistic evolution is not in itself a scientific theory, at least exclusively, but includes a range of views about how science relates to religious beliefs and the extent to which God intervenes. And there are also non-interventionist views where God is wholly involved through his imminent pull in the affairs of man. So, it's an ongoing process of interaction rather than uh, occasional supernatural intervention or quote-unquote miracle. Not that those don't or can't exist, but that's not where the focus lies. It rejects the strict creationist doctrines of special creation, but can include beliefs such as creation of the human soul. Modern theistic evolution accepts the general scientific consensus of the age of the earth, that is an ancient earth, or old earth creationism, the age of the universe, the Big Bang, the origin of the solar system, the origin of life, and evolution. And of course, all of these subcategory uh, academics are affected by this view as well, because it's all interconnected. So their view of history might be somewhat different, because they're looking through the theistic evolutionary lens. Supporters of theistic evolution generally attempt to harmonize evolutionary thought with belief in God and reject the conflict between, or the apparent crafted conflict between religion and science. They hold that religious beliefs and scientific theories do not need to contradict each other. So there we have some uniformity. Diversity exists regarding how the two concepts of faith and science fit together. Reading further, definitions. 
Francis Collins describes theistic evolution as the position that, quote, evolution is real, but that it was set in motion by God, unquote, and characterizes it as accepting that evolution occurred as biologists describe it, but under the direction of God. He lists several premises on which different versions of theistic evolution typically rest. They include, one, the prevailing cosmological model with the universe coming into being about 13.8 billion years ago, and some would say at this point even longer than that, the fine-tuned universe, evolution and natural selection, no special supernatural intervention is involved once evolution got underway, humans are a result of these evolutionary processes, and six, despite all these, humans are unique, the concern for the moral law, the knowledge of right and wrong, and the continuous search for God among all human creatures defy evolutionary explanations and point to our spiritual nature. The executive director of the National Center for Science Education in the United States, uh, Eugene Scott, has used the term to refer to the part of the overall spectrum of beliefs about creation and evolution, holding the theological view that God creates through evolution, albeit not simply Darwinian, It covers a wide range of beliefs about the extent of any intervention by God, with some approaching deism and rejecting the concepts of continued intervention or special creation, while others believe that God has directly intervened at crucial points, such as the origin of humans. In the Catholic version of theistic evolution, human evolution may have occurred, but God must create the human soul, and the creation story in the book of Genesis should be read metaphorically or allegorically, symbolically and spiritually, which is often ignored. Some Muslims believe that only humans were exceptions to common ancestry, human exceptionalism, while some give an allegorical reading of Adam's creation not exceptionalism. Some Muslims believe that only Adam and Hawa, or Eve, were special creations, and they, alongside their earliest descendants, were exceptions to common ancestry, but the later descendants, including modern humans, share common ancestry with the rest of life on Earth, because there were human-like beings on Earth before Adam's arrival who came through evolution. This belief is known as Adamic exceptionalism. And we learn something new every day. At least, that's what I think should be the case when doing theology. When evolutionary science developed, so did different types of theistic evolution. Creationists Henry M. Morris and John D. Morris have listed different terms which were used to describe different positions from the 1890s to the 1920s. Orthogenesis, nomogenesis, emergent evolution, and creative evolution were some terms, or evolution according to fixed law, and others, the Jesuit, and this is the point of the next back cover book report, I'll be covering this particular individual, the Jesuit paleontologist, Pierre T <clears throat> Thierry de Chardin, was an influential proponent of God-directed evolution, or orthogenesis, 
in which man will eventually evolve to the omega point of union with the Creator. And I would add to that that this idea of an omega point of union with the Creator is not in any way whatsoever unbiblical. That said, as a preamble to the next back cover book report, which will probably be my next post after this one, I want to introduce the two individuals. If you're not familiar, had ex uh, extensive works uh, written and produced on the ideas of panentheism, process, arguably non-dualism, theistic evolution, dipolar theism, and along those lines. These thinkers are less known within church circles who have adopted creation science as their uh, backdrop or platform. And as I've said before, I'm not advocating for one position over another, but just to, to give you, the researcher, the seeker, the student, more information, information that perhaps you did not have previously concerning this subject. So, the first individual is Alfred North Whitehead in Wikipedia's account of his life goes as follows. Alfred North Whitehead from 15 February 1861 to 30 December 1947 was an English mathematician and philosopher. He created the philosophical school known as Process Philosophy which has been applied in a wide variety of disciplines including ecology, and this is important, theology, education, physics, biology, economics, and psychology. Albeit, from a different metaphysical perception, these branches are based within. This is not classical theism. In his early career, Whitehead wrote primarily on mathematics, logic, and physics. He wrote the three-volume Principia Mathematica between 1910 and 1913 with his former student, Burton Ann Russell. This volume is considered one of the 20th century's most important works in mathematical logic and placed 23rd in a list of the top 100 English language notification books of the 20th century by modern library. Beginning in the late 1910s and early 1920s, Whitehead gradually turned his attention from mathematics to philosophy of science and finally to metaphysics. And this is where he pretty much turns everything on its head developed a comprehensive metaphysical system which radically departed from most Western philosophy. Which is another reason why we should, at least, become familiar with his views. Whitehead argued that reality consists of processes rather than material objects. So the classical physics was largely uh, uh, seethed in substance dualism. Whitehead argued that reality consists of processes rather than material objects, which is also where scientific materialism emerged as well. Another partial and particular view of reality that rejects God. 
Whitehead argued that reality consists of processes rather than material objects or substances, and that processes or events are best defined by their relations with other processes, thus rejecting the theory that reality is fundamentally constructed by bits of matter that exist independently of one another. So there we have the variations between classical and quantum mechanics, physics. Whitehead's philosophical works, particularly process and reality, his uh, magnum opus, if you will, are regarded as the foundational texts of process philosophy. So process theology emerged out of Whitehead's philosophy. Whitehead's process philosophy argues that there is urgency in coming to see the world as a web of interrelated processes rather than separated substances, which many spiritual traditions would say is maya or illusory compared to the numinous spiritual realms. The urgency is in coming to see the world as a web of interrelated processes of which we are integral parts so that all of our choices and actions have consequences for the world around us. And there is not one spiritual tradition that does not affirm that. We reap what we sow. <clears throat> Cause and effect. Karma. For this reason, one of the most promising applications of Whitehead's thought in recent years has been in the area of ecological civilization, or what you could call eco-theology, and environmental ethics, pioneered by John Cobb Jr., John B. Cobb Jr. And I believe he's the head and foundational contributor to uh, the Center for Process Studies and the Cobb Institute which educates persons in the relationship between theology and process philosophy. Okay, that's Alfred North Whitehead. And now, something that I mentioned earlier, Pierre Ter de Chardin is the other individual that my next book report will mention. And... The name of that book, by the way, is entitled The God of Tomorrow, Whitehead and Teilhard on Metaphysics, Mysticism, and Mission, written by philosopher, theologian, Bruce G. Epperly. A very astute and educated individual in process theology, Bruce G. Epperly. So Pierre Terre de Chardin, French, from uh, 1 May 1881 to uh, 10 April 1955. So Whitehead and Teilhard lived approximately in the same epoch or era. He was a French Jesuit Catholic priest, scientist, paleontologist, theologian, philosopher, and teacher. He was Darwinian and progressive in outlook, and this is prior to Darwin's publishing, or during the time where the publishing of Origins and our Species was uh, published by Darwin. He was Darwin and progressive in outlook, and the author of several influential theological and the uh, philosophical books. His mainstream scientific achievements included taking part in the discovery of Peking Man. His more speculative ideas, sometimes criticized as pseudoscientific, have included a vitalist conception of the Omega Point. 
along with Vladimir Vermdatsky. They also contributed to the development of the concept of a noosphere. In 1962, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith condemned several of Teilhard's works based on their alleged, alleged ambiguities and quote-unquote doctrinal errors. So he met with the degree of rejection during his lifetime. But scholars and theologians are definitely taking a second look at his work, perhaps from a less negative, critical eye. Some eminent Catholic figures, including Pope Benedict the 16th and Pope Francis, have made positive comments on some of his ideas since. The response to his writings by scientists have been divided. Teilhard served in World War I as a stretcher bearer. He believed several citations, or he received several citations and was awarded the Medaille Malaire and the Legion of Honor, the highest French order of merit, both military and civil. scientific writings. During his career, Teilhard published many dozens of scientific papers in scholarly scientific journals. When they were published in collections as books, they took up 11 volumes. John Allen Grimm, the co-founder and co-director of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology, said, quote, I think you have to distinguish between the hundreds of papers that Teilhard wrote in a purely scientific vein about which there is no controversy. In fact, the papers made him one of the top two of the three geologists of the Asian continent. So this man knew what science was. What he's doing in the phenomenon, or the phenomenon of man, and most of the popular essays that have made him controversial is working pretty much alone to try to synthesize what he's learning about through scientific discovery. discovery. More than with scientific method, what scientific discoveries tell us about the nature of ultimate reality, Grimm said those writings were controversial to some scientists because Teilhard combined theology and metaphysics with science and controversial to some religious leaders for the same reason. And that is the gist, in short, on Pierre Terre de Chardin. There are other sections, like his service in the war, research in China, if you want to check that out, or the Wikipedia on Pierre Terre de Chardin. So both Whitehead and Teilhard were early pioneers um, of the particular unified view that this particular uh, channel is attempting to convey. So apparently the science, some scientists were not ready to have that long conversation with metaphysics and theology. But I think as we're entering the 21st century that conversation is indeed taking place and it is a, a long time coming and hopefully it produces positive results and doesn't have theologians, the religions, spirituality, philosophy uh, coming out fighting but rather having productive conversations and cooperating. So in order to form a unified view, you must not reject the idea of having such 
a unified view. And I believe that we are at the juncture where perhaps maybe some may be willing to have that conversation. That said, my next post will be probably the back cover book report of The God of Tomorrow, Whitehead and Tehard on Metaphysics, Mysticism, and Mission by author Bruce G. Aperly. Thank you for listening.